From Providence, Rhode Island, welcome to The Potterverse. It's a podcast dedicated to the book and film universe of Harry Potter. So grab your favorite wands and time turners. Let's step into the night and pursue that flighty temptress adventure. Everybody and welcome back. My name is Mary Larson. My name is Blake, and uh, let me apologize in advance for my voice. <laughs> we, uh, I kind of sound like trash right now, and as you can hear, so does Mary. We have not been well. <laughs> but we're still here for the magic and the we're mystery of Harry Potter. So thank you for those of you who sent a little Lumos our way, but if we sneeze, cough, just sound different. If our if our usual Rhode Island and Bostonian accents are a little snufflier, <laughs> now you know why, right? And a little bit more enhanced. Ah. By sp- speaking of that, by the way, enhanced. Uh, common San Diego. Oh. Blake. Oh my goodness. Wait, 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 Where in the world is Carmen San Diego? The animated Netflix series. Yeah. Yes. Uh, on Netflix, obviously, as Mary said, and. I was Mary and, and and our daughter have been watching it. We've and, been binging it hard. <laughs> and no, you gotta say it right. We've been binging hard. it hard. We've wicked been binging hard. a wicked hard guy. <laughs> uh, all of a sudden, there are these two. It's not all of a sudden. They're her two besties, man. Redheaded. They're her Ron and Hermione. But pale looking, freckled, freckled, befreckled. <laughs> like brother and sister from Southie show up. Close your eyes. You think it's Blake. <laughs> Like what? What? How the hell did that? Ha- Who made that choice? <laughs> I don't know, but I'm here for it, and I love it. I absolutely oh, love it. That so, was great. yeah, if you have a, a school age child who likes things of that sort, I highly recommend it. Especially if you are into going different places. Hopefully, not though a mysterious graveyard. All right. No, don't do that. Even, you don't want to do hey, that. You know, even if you want to just remember your childhood, you know, the whole common San Diego thing. I feel like that that got big when do we were kids. Up, do, 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 uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then, and, and I feel like she kind of took a dip there for a while, but now she's back. Yes, Blake. Now she's back because the millennials brought her back. That's true. Good point. <laughs> Sorry, that's enough of common San Diego talk. I mean, Just like we brought back Ghostbusters. Or do you want to? You want to start? Do you want to start talking to uh, some Oregon Trail while we're at it too? I mean, yeah, hey, sure. while we're here, all of us late <laughs> late Gen Zs, early millennials, we're here for it. All right, so we are here at Chapter Thirty Six, The Parting of the Ways. If I thought I could help you, Dumbledore said gently, by putting you into an enchanted sleep and allowing you to postpone the moment when you would have to think about this happening tonight, I would do it. But I know better. Numbing the pain for a while will make it worse when you finally feel it. You have shown bravery beyond anything I could have expected of you. I ask you to demonstrate your courage one more time. I ask you to tell us what happened. Oh, man. This is one of the the two times in this chapter that I actually, I started to tear up. Yeah. Uh, It was this, it was obviously this one. And then it was when Molly goes and hugs Harry. Oh my gosh, and she gives him the motherly hug he's wanted his entire life. Yeah, and, and to recognize, obviously, that he's never had that feeling. Yes. Oh my, oh, my own. That was, <laughs> I, I, I feel Pretty like, heavy. that was a heavy thing for me. And, and I, I, I know there's a lot of, like, things and plot stuff that we could talk, but, and, and I'm happy to do that, Mary, but I really feel like the, the conversation when we get into this episode really should be about just the emotional stakes. So much happens in this chapter. This is one of the most beautifully complex chapters of this series. Yeah. Things are laid down. Things are put into motion. For as big as this book is, this chapter is what truly catapults us for the rest of the series, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. This is... This is th- uh, this chapter, in my opinion, is like all the... It, it's all that there is. It is. Uh, all the feels, all yeah. the nuggets, all the people. Yeah. People, places, and things that we love. Everything is in this chapter, and we cannot wait to get into it. But we do want to take a brief moment to thank our friends at jointhenerdclan.com because you, my friends, have made this possible. You've made all of the Mary and Blake podcasts episodes possible. And if you have not yet become a member there yet, we highly recommend you do. You just head to jointhenerdclan.com. All right, let's get into the show. Let's do it. I solemnly swear that I'm up to no good. (laughs) 
Holy flippin' smokes, here we go. Mini plot recap, which if you haven't recently read chapter 36 of The Goblet of Fire, hold on tight, spider monkeys. There's a lot. <laughs> but basically, Harry retells a story to Dumbledore and Sirius Black, and Sirius Black gets wicked mad the whole time, and then it gets to finally hang out with Madame Pomfrey in the hospital wing. But stupid Fudge lets a Dementor in and kills Barty Crouch Jr. with a kiss. And then Fudge and Dumbledore go neck and neck fighting about whether or not Voldemort is back. And Dumbledore says, you know what? Taking this matter to my own hands, Avengers assemble. Yeah, yep, that's it. Get the old crew back. Yes. <laughs> yes. I've, I feel like I've always wanted to say something of that sort to somebody. Hey, let's get the old gang back. Because <laughs> you know when that when someone says that, it, it only good stuff's going to happen. Mm. Like, I agree. You know, because the old gang knows that it probably shouldn't be together. Like the old gang knows we did a lot of stuff. We got into let's, some mischief. Let's go our separate the ways. The mischief was managed. So so that the world can continue with norm, in normality. Yep. But when the old crew comes back together, it's over and done with. I love it. Oh, love I that. love it. Love that. So, Mary, uh... I had those two moments that made me well. Do you agree with me that you want to, that it's? I think we frame this chapter around the emotionality of what's happening, or I think do we you need wanna... everything. Okay. There's just so much. There's yeah. so much that happens. Yeah. And Blake and I really pride ourselves in this podcast being spoilerific. Yes. And knowing what we do know in the future plays a massive part in this chapter. I mean, in this chapter, we get to have this glimmer in Dumbledore's eye when Harry tells him, oh, guess what? A little bit of my blood, (laughs) you know, was taken into this spell to help bring Lord Voldemort back to eye life. And there was a gleam of something like triumph in Dumbledore's eyes. Yes. And of course, this is because, um, yes, this gets rid of some of the protection that Harry had, some of it, some of it. But really... This blood inside Voldemort now is really going to be a huge part of his undoing. Right. Right. And Mary, and as easily, I think, as we can take now that answer now and say, oh, well, obviously, like, that's what Dumbledore is, you know, that gleam in his eye is referring to that. Could the opposite be said at the time? Right. So what is the opposite of that? Something that the what that some of his protections now gone. No, no, no. OK, I'm going to I'm going to take it even further. Dumbledore has a gleam in his eye <laughs> when yeah. when he learns that Voldemort can touch Harry. What you're saying is, oh, well, Dumbledore has recognized that this can hurt. Voldemort eventually. The opposite of that statement is, oh, this is going to finally hurt Harry. Uh, Actually, no. So this blood... No, no, no. What I'm saying is, uh, ultimately, could someone at the time reading this book Uh think, oh, is Dumbledore actually on Voldemort's side? Oh, okay, because of that quick little... Yeah, like Harry was just two-faced from a... From a professor that we've trusted for 35 chapters, should we be trusting? Okay, I see what you're saying. Just the gleam, that little moment of gleam of triumph. Oh, okay, nice. I mean, what's crazy? So, of course, this blood inside of Voldemort now means that he cannot kill and curse himself. You can't avada kedavra yourself. Correct. So, when Voldemort tries to kill Harry... In, a, in three books, right. he actually only is able to kill the Horcrux part of him. He is not able to kill Harry. Like right. he is unable to kill Harry because Harry's blood now runs throughout his but own But here's veins. the other question though. It, it, the, if you can't Avada Kedavra yourself, yes. fine, I'm willing to accept that. Yes. How is it that his Avada Kedavra could kill part of his own soul in Harry? That's a Horcrux. I don't even know, man. You're getting some deep stuff. <laughs> I just let's listen. get Slughorn. Where's Slughorn? Yeah, <laughs> it's all academic, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, me. that's a good deep but, nerd cut you know, right it's, there. It's so interesting because I, I chose the quote that I did 
Because he asks Harry to be courageous one more time. Yeah. And he tells him, you know, this is a lot of pain and numbing the pain for a while will only make it worse when you finally feel it. And all of these things I'm thinking, Dumbledore already knows. What do you Dumbledore mean? Dumbledore knows? knows that Harry is the sacrificial lamb. Dumbledore knows that, no, this isn't going to be, I ask you to demonstrate your courage one more time. No, this isn't going to be one more time, Dumbledore. We've got a oh, lot yeah. more times that you're going to be asking <laughs> Harry to demonstrate his courage. And thank God he's a Gryffindor and he's got, you know, countless amounts of courage coming out of him left and right. Yep. But obviously Dumbledore doesn't know every single bit, right? Like he doesn't know how many Horcruxes, he doesn't know fully everything. Well, again, that, that's the thing that so, we run into with, with the author and yeah, how but much I'm just can saying, we allow Dumbledore to know? Yes. But what I'm saying is that he knows obviously more than he's letting on. He's about to go tell Severus, please go play double duty. You know, we've had these massive plans laid out. Yeah. And reading this chapter now through the eyes that we know that Dumbledore knows mm-hmm. many things, which he is not sharing with Harry Potter. And he's just like, okay, Harry, this is going to be hard retelling this thing, but can you be courageous just one more time? Just, just one more time for me <laughs> versus you're going to have to kill Voldemort. Yeah. Like he's, you are going to have to die essentially. Faux die. Well, he's going to have to have the carrot on the stick here a little yeah, bit. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying is yeah. it's just like, okay, little 14 year old, like, oh, yeah. you just do this one more time when really I'm going to be asking a lot of you in two books time. Guys playing 4D chess. <laughs> exactly. That's what he's doing. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, I, I know you want to tackle the emotionality of this, and this is a, this is a honker of a chapter from yeah. what we had in the graveyard um, and everything. This is just a, in Veritas Serum was relatively short. Yeah. And then we get to this one, which so many things, of course, happen. So we start things off and Dumbledore leaves Barty Crouch with Minerva. Mm-hmm. He's like, guard him. You do what you got to do. Um, and then they get Alistair Moody taken care of. So a lot of these loose pieces, Alistair Moody, Winky, Madame Pomfrey takes care of them. All right. Yes. Last chapter, we're like, holy smokes. There's just yeah. too many people going and on. I right love here. when she's when they're like, hey, is Moody going to be OK? She's like, yeah, he's going to be fine. Right? Don't worry about it. <laughs> Guy's sitting motionless with his eye and his leg next to yep. his face. And he's, yep. <laughs> yeah, he's going to be fine. <laughs> You don't worry about that. <laughs> and the first thing that we really get from Harry in this chapter, though, is his worrying about Mr. and Mrs. Diggory. Yeah. Professor Harry mumbled, where are Mr. and Mrs. Diggory? They are with Professor Sprout, said Dumbledore. His voice, which had been so calm through the interrogation of Barty Crouch, shook very slightly oh. for the first time. She was head of Cedric's house and knew him best. Oh, man. Brutal stuff. Truly. Brutal stuff. And, and you know... the. <laughs> Dumbledore, I think, in this chapter shows himself uh, in many ways, Mm -hmm. uh, and especially in ways that, you know, we've all come, we've all come to see Dumbledore in a specific light, right? That that this all knowing, uh, ever powerful, calm, and even keeled wizard who, not did you put your name in the goblet of fire movie version right yes. everything has been Calm. i dare say calculated mm-hmm. but it was it, it's in this one moment when a kid has died and he doesn't have control over the situation something that as we have said mary before and we actually alluded to earlier how much does dumbledore know mm-hmm. right this cedric's death is not all part of the plan Right. Because we either have to accept that Dumbledore knows probably more than he's letting on or he's going by the seat of his pants. And that option can't work because there are too many things that are happening around him. So the fact that his voice just falters a little bit shows you that humanity that I don't have this all under control. I love that. I love, love, love that moment. You know, it's quite interesting is we've had Priori and Cantatum, we've had Veritas Serum, mm-hmm. we've had the Pensieve in this book, and yet none of those are used on Harry or Barty Crouch Jr. Ah, uh, see, okay. So to me, like Harry's going through a lot. Can't we just Pensieve his memory and let the little boy you... have a little sippy sip of Madame Pomfrey's warmed milk and take a little night night? Or is he unable to do that because the trauma could be protecting him and altering his memory? As we know, memories can be changed. 
So I'm whoa, leading to whoa, believe whoa, whoa, that Whoa, 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 Marvin, whoa, whoa, time out. What? <laughs> time out. What? A couple of chapters ago, you were saying that no matter what, you get an actual, real, factual- With Veritas Serum. No, 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 not with Veritas Serum. When you took the memory out, yeah, I was like, well, if you're taking memory out, how is it that that memory, either one, can't be altered by your own perception- But we know it can because of Slughorn. I know, but- a couple of episodes ago, you were arguing with me that it, we you would get a completely uh, factual, unbiased version. I'm, I'm changing of my I'm changing my <laughs> tune. Changing my tune right now. <coughs> Your take retracting. I am. Wow. Because yeah, like could they just <clears throat> bippity boppity boo that out, you know, and watch it on replay like right. they do for the NFL? That's what I'm, that's what you were arguing. Uh, yes. Of, yes, I know, but now I'm retaking, okay? Yep. I'm so taking your, it. Your take retracting. Because I'm wondering you're, why he couldn't have just done it for Harry, and it'll be just interesting. You're walking this Can take you just back. just let me, okay. <laughs> why don't you take over the conversation like no, you've no, been no, attempting no, no, to? No, 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 I just, I just love making fun of you, that's Thank all. Thank you. <laughs> Point taken, I, What I was about to say, though, Mary, was yeah, that no, you actually- Yeah, I know, because you butting in. No, Go. you actually <laughs> stole the words right out of my mouth as I was reading this, because we, I read this- chapter to the family uh, a couple of nights ago uh, and we right before we all went to bed and as i'm reading it i'm thinking why can't dumbledore just go in there grab that memory and say okay harry see you later right i think you are probably onto something because mary i agree that memories can be altered and i don't see how any memory that you take from someone's head is a completely factual unbiased a- accounting of events well okay so t- for example slughorn really really smart right yes. his altered memory was messed up it was like overdubbed you know when you see yeah, something and it's badly overdubbed oh, yeah. so this is a highly skilled wizard so I think that the replay button that we would hope and want is pretty accurate and if it is an altered memory there's signs pointing to it being altered sure yeah no I agree I agree so okay so your question is let's just take your assertion uh-huh. as fact Right, that Dumbledore. Better yet, no, no. Let's do this. Let's just take the assertion that the events are an unbiased view of events. Okay, that means Dumbledore could easily go in, grab the memory, send Harry to to you know on the, on the yellow brick Madame road, Pom- Madame Pomfrey's hospital wing, and and then he could figure it all out himself, take care of it. Or the other option is he gets it from Harry, knowing that he's only going to get Harry's perspective. And he chooses Harry. And to me, that reeks of, I need Harry to specifically do this. I specifically need Harry to retell these events. Okay, yes. Because Harry retelling the events does something. Okay. It gives... Dumbledore something that he couldn't get from just the memory itself. And that is Harry's will and determination mm-hmm. and part of his exceptionalism. Uh-huh. And it's, it's kind of part of his therapy. Is he is he purposely making Harry tell this story again to test him? Okay, here's what I think. I don't think that he would have pulled Harry's memory. I don't think there would have been any use whatsoever in pulling Harry's memory as evidence to show fudge the ministry. They all think that Dumbledore is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. We get to see that fudge is all against Voldemort coming back. They would totally say he made up this memory. You know, Pensieves don't seem to be like a very common thing. So they would be using this as Dumbledore's a liar. So is Harry. Mm Mm-hmm. So if anything, this pensive-like memory that could potentially have been taken from Harry Potter about the Triwizard Tournament would really just be for Dumbledore's replay purposes. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you. You know, he's recalling it now also in front of Sirius. So 
yeah, he could have pulled the memory, but then what's everybody going to do? Stand in line and dunk their head in the pensive one at a time and re-see it? Versus they don't necessarily get to have Harry's perspective, what he felt at that time, Mm -hmm. what he was understanding at that time. It's just really like seeing things um, eagle eye view. So I think having Harry say it is actually an easier, quicker thing. And then Dumbledore probably just bippity boppity booed his own memory. Okay, I can you know, repeat and rewatch what I just heard. Sure. Because it did just come straight from Harry. So he is going to have less time for, to forget and mix things up. And Sirius can now hear at the same time. But also I do think that there's something therapeutic for Harry to be able to get this all out Mm -hmm. versus, okay, I'm going to take Madame Pomfrey's drink, go night, night, but then dreading, I'm going to have to say all of this. And what if I forget some of it? Yeah. You know, yeah, they took my memory, but like, I'm still going to have to tell, but see, maybe serious. We still have to tell yeah. Ron. Like at least now he's able to say like I got most of it all out. Yeah, and he probably does sleep better. Don't we all? Don't they always say you shouldn't go to bed angry? Yes. So I feel like this was good for him, and Dumbledore will just pensive this own his own memory. Yeah. No, I agree with you, uh, my love. I, I just so that I think could have been wonder... used for for the ministry. But if the ministry really doubts Harry Potter's honesty, why didn't they to serum him? Fudge. If you doubt that Harry Potter True. really saw Voldemort, why don't you just veritas serum him? Well, maybe you can't do it against underage kids, and that's why it's such a big deal when Umbridge does it against Cho Chang. Maybe it's just not a thing that you do with Yeah, but kids. maybe if you had permission, right? If, if Or would he think, who's to say Barty Crouch Jr. didn't polyjuice into Voldemort? Or polyjuice into Wormtail? Right, and and... And this is kind of where I want to go also with this conversation, right? (laughs) Because you're right, Mary, there is a ton happening here and it's all happening at once. And it's happening at a a very uh, fervent pace. Harry gets in, uh, Harry ends up in the bed. Dumbledore says, Hey, tell me the thing. He tells, he tells the thing in front of Sirius and Dumbledore. Dumbledore says, thank you very much. Here's this medicine. Take it. Go to bed. We'll see you later. He walks away. Harry then wakes up because like, hey, you're going you're gonna to wake this kid up. Something's happening around Harry. He doesn't know what it is. McGonagall comes flying into the hospital wing. And she is, I mean, through the roof angry uh, in, in a way that, Harry has never seen her that angry and she's angry at Fudge because Fudge has decided we're going to take this Dementor and we're going to bring him into Hogwarts. I mean, that wasn't necessarily his plan. His plan wasn't Dementor number one. It was, I'm going to go and see the suspect and of course I need my Kevin Costner, my bodyguard. (laughs) Yes, that's true. Uh, But uh (sighs) But here's my question. Okay. And this is what I was building up to. Fudge. The suspense is killing me. Fudge walks in there, brings a Dementor. He knows exactly what he's doing. Not necessarily. No, he does. He does. He brings a Dementor in there. I think actually his cowardice prevented him from thinking things fully. I don't think he's a Slytherin. I think that... I, I don't think he's cunning enough to be like, oh, and I'm just going to pretend that I don't know what happens. No, when he you knows. When you bring a Dementor in. He knows. He knows. I Come think on. his... his uh... My whole point is this. It's all a little too convenient that this guy brings his Dementor in and the Dementor kills well, or sucks the soul out of Body Crouch. Like the one guy that has all the information... The one guy that they have in captivity. And then, after Crouch is gone, Fudge turns around and says, yeah, don't worry about it. Voldemort ain't back. He definitely ain't back. And he he denies it the entire time. And he even threatens Dumbledore to make him follow along with this idea. And when Harry's like, listen, I thought of this. I seen these people. Fudge's first instinct is to say, nah, you're lying. And you probably could have just read all these names in a book somewhere. And he's just he's trying so hard to deflect all of the attention 
mm-hmm. off of the, these surroundings. Now, am I saying that Fudge is in on all of this bad news, bad stuff? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not saying that he is, but I'm also not saying that he's not. And the again, the opposite has to can be true at the same time, which Mary, you kind of alluded to, which is maybe the guy can't admit that Voldemort is back and he wants Crouch dead and he wants to deny Harry and he doesn't want to give Harry the Veritaserum because if he acknowledges the fact that Voldemort is back, then he actually has to do something about it. And if he doesn't have to do something about it because he he can has he can have plausible deniability, then he doesn't have to take action. Yes. And like to me, Fudge has always felt like a company man. Like he he got he he got promoted because he needed to get promoted, and he didn't really have anything that was all exceptional about him other than the fact that he just towed the line. And. His, his instinct was that my career would be over if I brought in the Giants. My career this, and if we did that, and like, it just seems like one of those okay. guys who falls upwards. So I, I think there are two avenues here that we could go under for Fudge. So you're giving Fudge a bit more intellectual credit than normally he is portrayed as given. And you're thinking, I'm bringing this Death Eater in to silence this. This needs to be nipped in the bud. I am not having Voldemort return on my on my watch. Yeah. Or at least let his return be known to everybody on my watch. And I'm going to play dumb because people think I'm dumb. And I'm going to go in there and I'm going to give it to Dumbledore and say, don't, don't you dare. Don't you dare be a traitor because then we know what happens next month, next book. Right. It is. Harry is a liar. I, he takes over the school. Yeah. Something tells Ooh. me that, that Fudge has some like something in his background. I I know this is completely extra textual. I I understand. And I don't think that there is any textual evidence that suggests this other than these actions. These actions are very specific. And they're the intent. You could lay this intent on these actions and have it make sense. Like doesn't it feel like somebody's trying to cover something up? Okay. Like in, and either he's covering it up because something bad about him exists and he doesn't want out, or he's covering it up because if he admits that something is wrong, that means he actually has to do something about it, and he knows he's incapable of handling it. You know, when you put it into perspective that maybe he's more intelligent than I was giving him credit for, I'm down with this. I'm yeah. down with this politically scheming Cornelius Fudge. Yeah. I'm telling you, it, it's like, again, extra textual. I totally agree. Shoot. There's nothing that suggests it otherwise, other than these actions. Um, and, and I don't know, even when like, I don't know, it's just, he even tells, it's like he's keeping a running list for Dumbledore of all the things that he's letting Dumbledore do under his watch. Hey, I let you keep Hagrid. I, I I let you teach these kids pretty much whatever you want. I let all this stuff happen. I can make it so I don't let this stuff happen anymore. Like this all just seems. Oh, and, and, so bad. and even when he even when he, uh, he even when he leaves the the medical wing, right? <laughs> I love when he says he can't be back like it, it it's he almost says it as a whisper and it was just one of those one of those things like oh it feels like someone is is saying this to convince themselves yeah he ain't back he can't be back because now he's got a now there are again there are two avenues one he's still got to cover up the thing that he's got to cover up or two oh i can't handle this i don't want to handle this that's the way that it read to me. Oh, man. 
That's a lot. It is a lot. And these it's, are the things that were popping but, in no, my I brain. No, I get it. And that's why I'm saying when you read this chapter and you're really delving deep into each and every single character and their motives and what they're thinking about this truly chaotic and sad experience, it's crazy. I actually read a quick, I don't know, fan canon or something. Yeah, sure. That fanfic. Fanfic. I gotcha. That Harry killed Cedric and then he pretended it was Voldemort because he was jealous of Cedric the whole time. Jealous that he had a loving family. Jealous oh. that he got Cho Chang. <laughs> Fine. Vada Kedavra. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Oh, that is great. Obviously, that's not what happened. No, no. I and it, Oh, and then here's another thing, too, that pops up. <laughs> Dumbledore brings up the notion that he... Uh, Fudge allowed the last member of one of the purest bloodlines of wizardry to die or to be, you know, to be kissed by the Dementor. Yes. And that feels to me like that's just another chink in the armor in terms of like the way that Fudge reacts to that. It feels like something else is here. Something is there. I I can't quite dig it. I can't get my fingernail underneath it, but I can feel it. In your fingers and in your toes. <laughs> in my fingers and in my toes. I don't know. I again. I just. I, it's. It's a lot. It's a. It's, it's just thrown in there. About this chapter, you know, um, just has so incredibly much. It, Dumbledore goes into great detail about priori and cantatum about ghosts versus echoes which gotta be real with you after reading this series many a times i still don't understand an echo still don't understand yeah, an I don't, echo. I, I i i know that she tries to whistle past the, the author that she tries to whistle past the graveyard here with this echoes versus ghost thing but and then we got you no. know the horcrux bring it in a, uh, not the Horcrux, sorry, the Deathly Hallow bringing about the echoes essentially of his parents. Just don't get it. If one of you nerds can actually turn around and tell me the real difference between an echo and a ghost. Well, the ghost stays. The ghost hasn't moved on. The ghost has unfinished business. Sure. They're not ready to pass on and they stay put. Not the story for these these blokes. I don't know. I don't know. I just, I, I, I still, I'm not now, What's interesting it. too is that it's only the spells. It's not the previous spells. This is the other thing that I found interesting. So we have Priori and Cantatum in the beginning of this series, in the beginning of this book. Yes. When they take Harry Potter's wand in the Priori and Cantatum and outshoots the Dark Mark. Yep. And they're saying, okay, this was the previous spell. This was the previous incantation. Yes. Are the only incantations that Voldemort did during that time, with his wand, I should say, are the only um, spells that were done with Voldemort's wand during that time killing spells? The math suggests yes. Because if that is the one wand, so if Wormtail is using that wand, because it's priori and cantatum of the wand. Yes. It's not, a lot of people get upset because they're like, oh, kill the spare, Wormtail killed the spare. Yes, just like Priori and Cantatum, did Harry Potter's wand show the dark mark? Did Harry do it? No. Barty Crouch Jr. did it. So right. it's on the wand itself. I'm 99% sure that Wormtail's wand uh, is, is actually non-existent, that he gets another one from Ollivander uh, mm -hmm. later in the series because he lost it when he betrayed everybody yeah. and got like... You know, um, so he was ratified. using Voldemort's wand. So he's wand. been using Voldemort's wand this time. So that's why when they vol when they priori and cantatum it. But Wormtail did spells on Harry. He like tied right. him up to the tombstone. Mm -hmm. He did other things. So why didn't priori and cantatum have you know things come on out in addition to dead people? Mm. You know that Wormtail probably bippity boppity booed some extra stuff while yeah. he had Voldemort's wand. Uh, yeah. That's what Priori and Cantatum is. So maybe this was a special Priori and Cantatum that happened because of the Phoenix feather wand cores, and it's different than the one that they use on Barty Crouch Jr.'s wand in the beginning of the book. Mm. But I just found it quite interesting because we know for a fact he at least did one other spell. When he tied Harry Potter up. Hmm. 
So just wanted to throw that out there. And maybe maybe it did come out and Harry didn't notice it because he was too busy looking at dead people like Haley Joel Osment. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fair. It, it absolutely is fair because you would have to imagine that other spells did occur with that wand, uh, you know, in between, you know, uh, at least at least the happenings of the Goblet of Fire, but uh, like off off page, right? There were uh, maybe like one day they were hungry and he, he whistled up a cup of elven bread. I don't know, like <laughs> something something else happened here. Um, I don't know. So it's just, yeah. You know, I think that's a really great uh, point to make. Mary. Thanks. Fun thing, of course, we get to have some more Fox time and Fox once again nurtures Harry. So we get to have lots of people. You're talking about the emotionality of this chapter. Sure. Yeah. We get so much love and protective natures coming from Sirius. You know, I don't want him to talk, let him sleep. And he's, he's gets, he, there's many outbursts from yeah. Sirius as he's rehearing this story, especially when Harry talks about how Wormtail sliced his arm. And we get a lot of protective things, obviously, coming from Mrs. Weasley. Like, Mm -hmm. you talked about her giving the hug, but Fox comforts Harry. She sings a little song. She does her little magical tears. And it's just so interesting. You know, we sit there and we wonder, does Fox treat everybody like this? Or is it because Harry has her tail in his wand? I get the sense that there's a little bit of favoritism. Right? Like, she's like, you have my boy, Blue. Yeah. You know? Like, Dumbledore loves you. You got my tail. We're, we're buddies. You kind of like my kid. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, yeah, I know that you're an orphan, so I will adopt you as my fellow Phoenix baby. Yep, absolutely. You're like a you're like a little adoptee. <laughs> and how interesting that Fox only gave up two feathers. Obviously, she shed more. Birds mm-hmm. shed feathers, sure. And did it makes you wonder, like, what does Ollivander do? Does he just ask people, "Hey, can I have some of your"? <laughs> <laughs> Your unicorn tail hairs. Does anybody have a phoenix I can use a feather for? You know. Yeah. And then how awkward going over to Romania. Anybody have some dead dragon hearts <laughs> ripped into strings for me to use? You know, just does, weird. Does, does he just follow Fox around waiting for feathers to drop? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I really like that bird. I'm gonna make a great wand. Oh yes, left two. <laughs> uh, oh man. Um. So we got this loving stuff coming from people. And then we've got McGonagall, who is livid, as oh, you said. Oh, just on fire. Just on fire. And it is hard to blame her uh, because Fudge just walks in there doing whatever he wants to do. And this guy ends up killed because of it. And he's like, he's just walking in. Yeah, okay. You know, you and you know, she. McGonagall doesn't suffer any fools. I'm surprised she didn't put a spell on Fudge and stop him. I I agree. Or expect your Patronumed. Well, why would you expect your Patronum? To get the Dementor out. Make oh, that little oh, kitty, oh, oh, okay. the kitty Patronus do its job. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Meow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but maybe it just happened so quickly. I think, it, I think it all kind of happened very quickly. Shock factor. Y- yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know she doesn't suffer any fools, but you also do know that she has a respect for authority. Uh, yes. And she knows that Fudge, regardless of his actions, is still the minister of magic, right? And, you know, how would it look to Dumbledore that if she just, you know, uh, Petrificus totalist this guy in- into... Potter would have done it. A, into oblivion. And he's Potter would patronist and petrified. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I think that. But here's something that also happens to Mary. There is, I think there are two main things that happen that really help solidify plot going forward. Number one, we have the fact that Voldemort is now able to touch Harry. That raises the stakes for the rest of the story. Harry was unable. Not only did Voldemort come back, but the protection that Harry was afforded is now gone. And as the reader, without knowing all the stuff that we know later on in the books, this is really now life and death for Harry. Yeah. Because Voldemort can touch him. So it raises the stakes of the story and it allows us to get nervous about the fact that something here is going to happen between these two. It sets these two on a course of collision, no matter what now. 
Like at least before you could say, well, no matter what, Voldemort can't touch Harry. So th- even if they do collide, it ain't gonna matter. Now they're on a collision course, and you're just waiting for these two for this thing to happen. The other thing that happens is that we get an actual, real, one hundred percent confirmation that Snape was a Death Eater because he shows the Doc yes. Mock on his arm to everybody. To everybody. And is just like, and the way that he says it too, he's like, he's like, here, yeah. like, he's like angry about it. He's almost embarrassed. Like they, there's, there's a vitriol behind it. Oh, I didn't get an embarrassed vibe. <laughs> I, <sighs> just a proof, just a solid, here you go. You know, perhaps, perhaps I'm looking into it and I'm, Maybe you're seeing it through a Slytherin's perspective. Yeah. Not the Gryffindor eyes of me being like, ha ha! (laughs) (laughs) Wait, what would you be like? (laughs) Okay, good. Just making sure. (laughs) Here's my proof. (laughs) Luckily, I got a clean cut of that. We'll be saving that sound. Um, I don't know. I, 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 maybe I'm reading into it the way that it was presented and the way that it was written by the author, but it just felt to me like it was all of the things that ha- that that Snape was presenting, uh, along with obviously the dark mark, uh, and that is interesting because it 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 confirms what Harry thought this whole time. Yes, that Snape. Well, and he thought he knew good. too because he had seen in the Pensieve. So he's known since the Pensieve that Snape was a Death Eater, a former Death Eater. So that was already affirmed to Harry, but not to everybody else. Right. That that's what I'm saying. Everybody else was probably like, "Oh my gosh!" Whoa! What? <laughs> what? Right. Right. And it. And, and it, he's so in it that he's a tattoo. Right. <laughs> like he went that deep into this that he got a tat, a matching tattoo. Oh, man. I, I, and I just like that because it confirms all the things that Harry thought. It confirms all the things that like all the doubts that we all kind of had at Snape as readers up until this point. Uh, you know, again, of course, without knowing what comes later on in the books, we as readers have had these doubts about Snape. Mm-hmm. And eventually, you know, those doubts kind of come back again uh, later on in these books. When, you know, when Snape is out there and doing Nevada Cadaver on Dumbledore and doing the whole thing. Like, this, this is one of those moments where we as readers can turn around and say, yep, I knew it. I knew it. Uh, and because he has that thing. Mm-hmm. And like, there's no turning back from that. It's just so interesting. You know, he does this in front of someone who he despises. He doesn't even realize it yet, but he does it in front of Sirius. Oh, yeah. Um, does it in front of Molly Weasley, who, you know, here is a parent of many of his students, mm-hmm. just because there's so many <laughs> Weasleys. <laughs> um, you know, so putting it out there, knowing that this may be something that goes around. I mean, how really diverse is uh, Dumbledore's faculty? Fudge isn't kidding. Like what kind of in in a in a Malfoy say as I mean Malfoy's dad is a Death Eater so yeah. it's fine but like does Neville's grandma know about uh, that Snape one of Neville's teachers is oh, a, it's Death a Death Eater yeah that's what I'm saying like thank goodness Rita Skeeter gets captured this is a lot this is some juicy material right, <laughs> right. here but he's using it to prove a point he's using it to stand by the person who he trusts the most who is Dumbledore yes. And actually doing it to back up Harry Potter. Oh, of all people. (laughs) So, yeah, I I feel like this is the chapter that sets us on the course for everything that's coming our way. Uh, And the fact that the author was able to raise the stakes, foreshadow the plot of what's coming about Voldemort and Fudge and the clash of the ministry with Hogwarts and, you know. The press. The press. Harry throwing out, you know, you read Reader Skeeter, like this is going to huge be a big, huge thing. Yep. And then also adding a dash of Snape in there and, you know, confirming 
some doubts, yet at the same time spreading just enough there where we can say, but maybe, maybe, yes, he has that tattoo, but, you know, like... Why why does, since we're on Snape, why does he kind of flinch when Malfoy's name is brought up? Because Harry says... um, Look, I saw Voldemort come back, Harry shouted. He tried to get out of bed again, but Mrs. Weasley forced him back. I saw the Death Eaters. I can give you their names. Lucius Malfoy. Snape gave a sudden movement, but as Harry looked at him, Snape's eyes flew back to Fudge. Why? Mm, That's good. I like that. See, I love these little things. What do you think is the purpose of that? I think it's, ooh, that's who I can go visit first. I'm still friends with the Malfoys. Cool. He returned. So Malfoy's in with Voldemort. So I will go visit Malfoy first to be like, listen, I'll come back. Oh, that's a good one. I like that. Because, yeah, if Malfoy returned, you know, Malfoy's back in. He felt his tattoo glow. It's, you know, glow and grow, baby. Yeah. And, um... So he thinks that's my end. I can't just show up to Voldemort. I don't know where Voldemort's going to be next, but I know where Malfoy is. Yeah, you and know, I'm in with him. Mary, again, knowing what we know now, yeah, I I have to agree with you on this one. I have to, I have to, because since he has heard the fact from Harry that Voldemort is back, he yes. believes it and he knows yes. it, and he knows that he's got to have an answer because somehow, some way, his actions are going to get back to Voldemort. And he knows that Dumbledore, because Dumbledore now knows that Voldemort is back, he's probably going to have to end up going back to Voldemort at some point. He's known this probably for years. Like all of these things. You know, but now this is his in. I think that quick look is awesome. Now I know who I need to go you, speak yeah, to. Yeah, you know when you have a situation that happens, in, the, in that instant, when that situation happens... You're like, okay, what are my options? You you have this split second in your brain mm-hmm. when your brain goes into overdrive. When you hear something and you're like, okay, this changes everything. What do I do now? Like, you know, like let's say for the sake of argument, yep. y- your flight gets canceled. You're like, in that split second, you know, okay. I work well in those split seconds. You do. I got to get an Uber. I got to get a hotel. <laughs> I got to, you know, I got to find my bags. This all happens. Blake just calls me, uh, <laughs> oh man. My flight got canceled. I don't, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm on it. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you, you get all these things and it happens in that, that yes. one second. That's and that is what's happened. happening to Snape yes. at that very moment. Because think about it. He is the head of their only son's house. He's in yeah. very good standing yeah. with him. You know, he gives Malfoy straight A's. Yep. Um, or is it O's? Outstanding. Uh, sure, whatever. <laughs> Stats are for nerds. Um, yeah, I think that that's what his look is. Yeah. Not, oh no, he just said my buddy, because they're not buddies. They're not buddies. Well, Malfoy may think that they're buddies. I don't think Mal- I don't think Malfoy thinks he's buddies with Snape. I think Snape is too poor. Hmm, interesting. I think we'll talk to him, and he's our student's professor, and we admire him, yeah. but we're not hanging. He's a poor. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I like this. All right, Marvin, is there anything else that you want to talk about for this particular chapter? Anything else that stands out to you that you think, well, you know, this this might be worth our, uh, <laughs> our extraordinarily important time? Oh, I mean, goodness gracious, there's just too much in this chapter. I mean, hello, yeah. Dumbledore sends Snape off to do his, his big mission. Yeah. How can we not? I, Severus, I, said Dumbledore, turning to Snape, you know what I must ask you to do? If you are ready, if you are prepared. I am, said Snape. He looked slightly paler than usual, and his cold black eyes glittered strangely. Then good luck, said Dumbledore, and he watched with a trace of apprehension on his face as Snape swept wordlessly after Sirius. Snape swept wordlessly. I like that. It was several minutes before Dumbledore spoke again. Several minutes. He just Mm. sat there. (laughs) I mean, truth be told, the... The crux of the series does depend upon this this secret agent move right here. So I appreciate sitting silently for several minutes. Right. The, the, this is the if foundation upon which the rest of the series is built. 
It's it's not the rest of the series, well, but Dumbledore's plan. Well, uh, yeah, but Dumbledore's plan pretty oh, much no. encompasses the rest of the series. What? With all those S's, Siri thought I was talking to her and started <laughs> to talk to me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I, I would actually say the majority of the rest of the se- series found, finds its foundation in this chapter. I would, yes. Not necessarily in this one bit, not the Snape bit, especially next book. The next book really uh, doesn't deal with Snape needing to do this double agent stuff. Well, but in regards of Fudge and the situation with Rita Skeeter and being against Dumbledore um, and trying to hide memories or find memories, you know, all of that kind of stuff does play roles from here on out. Sure, sure. It's... Mm. Very interesting. Very interesting what the author does. I know I've said this now a bunch of times in this episode, so I won't say it again, but I, I am thoroughly impressed that she was able to lay the foundation and, the, and, and the, the, the framework for what is to come all in here. And, it, and it's not in your face. I mean, it is relatively in your face with the whole, you know, hey, like, you know, fudge. You're going to do what you're going to do, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And... You Maybe know what? We'll meet in the middle. If we do, great. If we Doubtful. don't, then no problem. <laughs> and I, I, I love Fudge's reaction to that too. When he was like, "If you think you're gonna go against me," and 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 Dumbledore holds his hand up, he's like, "Nope. The only person to whom I intend to go against is Voldemort. So if you are against Voldemort, then we, Cornelius, are on the same side. Mm-hmm. It is the most Dumbledorean way to handle this problem that I could ever imagine. I can't see like." It is the perfect Dumbledore solution and reaction. The way that this guy is just losing his brain. Mm-hmm. And Dumbledore is just calm, collected, and I'm not here to hurt you, but I got things. You got things. We'll figure it all out in but the middle. Imagine if he trusted Dumbledore. How differently. Like, let's just play. Let's just vamp for a second. Sure. If he trusted Dumbledore, uh-huh. if he oopsed Barty Crouch Jr., yep. sorry about that forgot dementors (laughs) suck souls she left my pet at home um and i said okay you know you never led me astray dumbledore Mm -hmm. i'm kind of freaked out not gonna lie this isn't really my forte voldemort stuff (laughs) this is more your your neck of the woods yeah uh what do we do what would dumbledore so dumbledore said get the giants on your side yeah he immediately lays out his plan he says please get rid of the dementors they're bad news bears Mm -hmm. What else do you think would have happened? I think immediately there would have been massive aura searches for all things Voldemort. And that really depends. And now Could you're that getting... that have gone bad, though? Well, that's... I was just about to say that because now you're, now you're starting to get into a conversation of how far do you go? And, yeah. Right? Uh, is this like... <laughs> oh, is this like the Freedom Act, mm-hmm. right? In in the early two thousands, after September eleventh, like governments doing things that they, you know, mm, can you really do that? But we're just allowing you to do it because we're scared. Do you know that most of the Freedom Act that I know is from that Will Smith movie? Which which one? The one where all the cameras are watching him all the time, and he has to like run away and. He's freaking out. It's not his fault. He didn't do it. Oh, oh, I love that movie, too. Oh, what the heck is the name of that movie? Oh, it's, it's with Gene Hackman. Yeah. And, and, uh, and Gene Hackman is like a hacker, which is uh, just hysterical. Enemy of the state. There you go. Yes, I love that movie. That's what I think about. <laughs> when the government knows too much about you, I think I might be like Will Smith, wrongly accused for something. Yeah, yeah. And then they can find me on every traffic camera and, and and they will go to extraordinary lengths to obtain information and you know the whole thing I, listen it's all history now it is what it is i'm not i'm not trying to spark mm-hmm. a, a political debate however the intentions and the political ramifications are beyond debate now it just it is it's a matter of fact that there were instances where the government overstepped the, its lines. Doesn't matter what, how, when, doesn't matter. What I'm saying is, is there, an, is there an avenue by which the Ministry of Magic 
oversteps its bounds in a potential search for Voldemort should probably, Fudge listen. Probably there would have been an oopsie. It would I, have been a big I problem. Would, I would guarantee so. And the hmm, the easy nature with which or by which wizards could control a narrative or control a situation to make something go away, whew, that sends shivers up your spine. Great. And the reason why we all know about this is because Body Crouch Jr. turned his dad into a bone. <laughs> <laughs> also, fact, not opinion. <laughs> uh, I do want to also make note that Dumbledore shouts or says, you are to alert Remus Lupin, Arabella Fig, Mundungus Fletcher, the old crowd. Yeah. And I love this because we've heard about Mrs. Fig since day one. Sure. You know, Mrs. Fig, the cat lady on Privet Drive. Mm-hmm. And so I just, I adore that here she is. Because she's, of course, she's she's right there in the beginning of book five. Comes on out with the Dementors there. Don't put your wand away, Harry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yet this is where if you're reading too quickly... Or you forgot the crazy cat lady's name, you would have just been like, whatever, person, person, Remus Lupin. Right. That's all I know. Nevertheless, the old crowd's coming back. And I, again, as we said at the top of this episode, I'm very excited for that. And, and this, I, this is one of the, if Warner Brothers was to continue making a Harry Potter franchise in some form or fashion, in my opinion, it would probably have to be based either, you know, in a, in a timeline that is like way, like almost to the original founders of Hogwarts or this time, the old order of the Phoenix, mm-hmm. right? Like th- I think those two are ripe for picking. Ripe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right Marvin, you got anything else for this chapter no all right it is the penultimate chapter I'm so of big. this book oh so so big so this is when the big boy pants come on uh yes big boy pants are out yes they're with they're they're ready to be uh Legs dropped into at this point. <laughs> uh, you know, we do have a tradition here at Mary and Blake Media that we oh, have. We're not doing what? other perspective? Well, well we're going to oh. get there. Oh, sorry. Uh, we do have a tradition here at Mary and Blake Media that you know, when we watch our shows, when we get to the penultimate episode of a show and of a particular season or of a series, we ask Mary, do we have momentum going into the final episode? And I guess my question to you, Mary, is... Not necessarily do we have momentum going into the final chapter because this is this is you know if, if, for all intents and purposes the the big you know final like chat that Harry has with Dumbledore and everything has been solved and we're, you know we're we're moving on with life. However, we are getting to the next book. Is this ending? Does this provide enough momentum for you? leading into the next book. Yes. Does it? Yes. <laughs> Care to amplify? I mean, hello, this chapter was the chapter of all chapters. We just said not only does it lead into the next book, but the rest of the series. Yep, fair enough. All right, you ready for some different perspective? Yes. Let's go, Marvin. Holy cricket, you're Harry Potter. I'm Hermione Granger, and you are... Snoop. Snape, man. Hey, what's going on? Seen that tattoo on your arm? That looks a little rough. That hurt? No, I'm I'm going to Lucius Malfoy's. I'm actually quite proud of it. <laughs> what are you gonna do with Lucius? I heard he is a uh, he's a, he's a a Death Eater here. Yeah. I'm so pumped. <laughs> so pumped. Okay. You know, I've been playing. I've been playing Dumbledore all this time. Have you? But yes, I have. Well, in chess, checkers, Monopoly, all of it. Kelly Clarkson. A w- Kelly Clarkson Trivial Pursuit, most <laughs> most certainly. <laughs> what doesn't kill you does make you stronger. And indeed. That's, indeed, and that is what I'm going to tell Voldemort, okay. which may be a tough topic, but maybe that's what I'll say to him. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Potter didn't kill you, <laughs> but he made you stronger. <laughs> <laughs> and 
one scene right there. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why they're like so funny. <laughs> I can't recover from that. Oh, the different perspective. It it kind of has to end when you nearly kill the co-host. I know. You know, I was I was really wanting to do a shout out for Molly Weasley with okay. the hug and just sure. this being such a special chapter for her. And you, I mean, how can you not love this woman after this chapter? Sure, Everything yeah. she does for Harry. Um, but really, kind of want a bit of boring. Double perspective, yeah. Different no, perspective. No, let's 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 get it up with Snape, man. I'm in. Let's go. All right, we got uh, some emails here. Let's get into that. Oh, miles here. All right, Marvin. This one comes from Joel. Hello, Joel. And Joel says, "Well, it's not like you asked at the end of the episode, anyway." But I think that the spell of stupefy for the last chapter stupefy. was aimed at Fo Moody through the door. Dumbledore's spell was so powerful, it blasted through the door to hit Moody. <laughs> that led Harry to marvel at Dumbledore's power moments later. Ooh. Stupefy does shatter and destroy things it hits as evidenced in times like the battle at the Ministry. Mm-hmm. Anyway, my thoughts, because neither of you seem to hear me when I talk to you during the podcast. Either way, thank you for the podcast. Oh, thanks for emailing, Joel. <laughs> Joel? You're right. We, we don't hear you. Well, who knows? Maybe he's listening, like in his car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe on his treadmill, and he's just talking back to us. Through I know. The, through his head bar- and earbuds. He, he's just wishing and hoping. Thinking and praying. <laughs> One day. <laughs> One day they'll. One day they'll Mary speak will hear back me. To me. Well, Joel, here you go. We're talking back to you. I got you. I I appreciate your uh, your email. Thank you so much. All right, Marvin. That is it. That is it for the rest of this episode. Anything else before we move on to the final chapter? Of the Goblet of Fire. Just know that we love your emails. Yes. So if you do, if you have a burning opinion or question, we would love for you to send it on in at maryandblakemedia at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. And don't forget, you can um, find Blake and I on Instagram and Facebook. You could join our communities there. Just search Mary and Blake. I know it's been a little bit of a while since we've uh, finished a book uh, recently, so after this, we do the movie. Uh, well, yes, we. What we do, what <laughs> what happens here is we do. We you and I, we watch the film. Yes. And while we are watching the film, we, we do. Record. We do a film commentary as we're watching the film. It's like the most annoying viewing of a movie ever. That is correct. Because we just don't stop talking. But maybe Joel will be happy because we're talking. But the idea is that you press play and you watch it along with us and you just pretend that we're there chilling on the couch. Drinking some butter beers. Just so you know, I like a lot of room for myself. (laughs) (laughs) If there is a single seater, I will generally be in it. Never cuddles. Two blankets. Never once cuddles. Only when I'm sick. (laughs) (laughs) And even then, it's for like... It's like a it's like a half a cuddle. Oh my gosh, I move too much. That's the problem. I have restless legs. <laughs> and if you have a cat, I she will co- gladly let the cat sit on my lap. She cocoons. I do. Oh god, the cocooning drives me crazy. Love it. See, so I, I I'm a physical person. Okay, I'm a my love language. Yes. physical touch. Great. All I want to say is I want to cuddle every once in a while. That's wonderful, especially when we watch a movie. I'll schedule it in. <laughs> <laughs> so either way, that uh, the commentary track will be at jointhenerdclan.com as soon as we finish it. Then Mary and I will come back here on the podcast and uh, speak about the movie uh, in more in terms of a review, uh, similar to how what we're doing uh, right now in in uh, with the with the chapters. And then after that, we're moving on to the Order of the Phoenix. So excited! Which, by the way, my favorite movie. For Harry Potter. We all know, Blake. Oh, it's great. Love it. All right, let's close this bad boy out, shall we? Yes. Here we go. Thank you all so very much for tuning in. We're excited. The next chapter is the last one. That's it, man. They always wrap it up with such a nice little bow. It's like, there's been death and destruction. Go back home, you little rascals. <laughs> it all happened once again. <laughs> Filch will <laughs> fix the school over holiday break. <laughs> it all happened nice and easy right before the ending of June. Episky. <laughs> Episky. <laughs> All better. You think he just he points his wand at the school and says a pisky? <laughs> Phil doesn't have a wand, Blake. Whatever. 
<laughs> this is the nurse. This is Norris picks it up and gives it to Dobby. Dobby does it. Episky. Dobby wouldn't even need a wand. You just Dobby would just snap fingers. the fingers. That's it, man. Oh my gosh. Elf magic. They don't That's mess what around. Happens. What happened to the elves? Yeah, what happened to the elves at the Battle of Listen, Hogwarts? Were they just down no, in the kitchen I'm still not making food? About the Battle of Hogwarts, I'm saying now. We spent so much time talking about them and worrying about their welfare. Exactly. And all we get is Madame Pomfrey go check on Nobody Winky. Nobody cares about the elves. Oh my gosh, Dobby is Don't my nobody want to talk about the elves. Character. That's why the whole stupid spew thing Stop. in this book doesn't matter. Whoa. I'm so glad they cut it out of the film. Oh my gosh. My name's Mary. <laughs> my name's Blake. <laughs> Mischief managed. <laughs>